Thank you. He's out of town. Billy White. What um, you got, Tommy? It is, I think, four on the dock. Uh, I do too. Is this the last time we're going to get to ask you that, Tommy? <laughs> I guess I'll be at a workshop, the last workshop, I think. Okay. Okay, I call this meeting to order at this time. It's called a meeting to advertise to take action on ordinance number 976. Give you some details on this action. The state passed legislation a couple of years ago that permitted the cellular phone company to place small cell towers in the municipality right of ways. The city is able to pass an ordinance to regulate the placement and design of the poles, but are not allowed to deny the permits. We also must give them an initial response their application within 30 days. That's why we're kind of at a timeline here today. 30 days is the clock is ticking. So thank you for being here today on this call meeting. John Cleveland, he drafted an ordinance. And now uh, most of you've got it, I guess, by phone. Have a chance to read it. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck give us sort of a summation on this and let us know that uh, first brief of what we are going to be voting on today. So ordinance 976, if you've had a chance to look at it, the basis of this ordinance goes back to the act that was passed in April of 2018 uh, by the state legislature. Uh, the state legislature decided that in conjunction with cell phone companies instead of 300 plus municipalities with different rules and different sets of laws uh, relegating these cell phone companies to different areas that the state would preempt that and pass legislation that allowed them to come in allowed them to use the municipalities right of ways to place their small cell cell towers and sort of give them a similar status as utilities, uh, uh, phone, those kind of things. Uh, the ordinance that you have in front of you is basically a uh, impasse, sent us some suggestions on, on ordinance, sample ordinances. Uh, we, we looked through those. Uh, John Cleveland added a lot of information that was in their suggestion. But what we're dealing with are cell towers that are that are uh, about 40 to 50 feet tall. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Cell towers that are 40 to 50 feet tall. At the top of them, there's an antenna that, that to give you visual, sort of about that tall, about that wide. Uh, almost the, the, the width of a, a utility pole itself. And then at the bottom, there is a, yeah. yeah. You guys have the drawing? I, right? I printed it out for planning okay. commission, but that, I was yeah. just passing the house. This is one that's proposed, and, and I wanted to kind of get into this application in just a minute. Uh, they have they have a uh, a box basically that that is the router and some other things that, that causes this equipment to work. It mounts usually about halfway up the pole. Uh, the application that, that's been submitted was submitted by Tilson Technologies on behalf of the U.S. Cellular. Uh, they submitted that on September 5th. And by state law, we have 30 days to basically reply to this application as to whether or not it, it meets our guidelines, whether or not there's any missing information, whether or not uh, we're going to deny certain ones based on criteria that we can deny very limited amount of criteria that we can deny on, but, but there is some criteria. Um, they, they are proposing eight locations within the city limits of Sweetwater, uh, one of which is on Mays Avenue, uh, one is near Engelman Park, uh, there's another one located just behind the Town and Country Store uh, on Sweetwater Barnum Road, one just behind uh, the old Sweetwater Valley Bank, Thompson Cancer Center, 
that building there on Sweetwater Bottom Road, just behind it. Um, there's one on Fair Street that's near the uh, Oakland View subdivision entrance there. Uh, there's also another one on Chestnut Street uh, that they've not really identified the exact location of that one. And then one on Tech Drive, just across from uh, Gamma Plastics and uh, near White's Marble Works up in the industrial park. Um, so when we got this application, we basically we, we needed to have some sort of guidelines to be able to to get back to this cell phone company with and say, okay, here's what the city is is agreeable to, and, and here's what are some of the conditions that we will allow you to, to locate in the right of way and what, what you'll have to, I guess, uh, adhere to. Uh, I want to talk just a minute about that timeline that we talked about. Uh, the, the, the initial 30 days, we, we have to do one of three things in that 30 days. We, we either have to approve, approve or deny. We have to get back to them with information that they're missing in their application. And there's a very specific set of information that they have to give in that application. Or we have to schedule a conference with them so that they can answer questions that we may or may not have uh, about their uh, uh, installation. Uh, one of the biggest things that this ordinance allows us to do, uh, and probably the most important, since we're state has sort of hamstrung us in, in that we, we have to allow them to locate in the city's right of way. Uh, the state did, does allow us to put some uh, stipulations on what the design is. So in, in this ordinance, the first several pages are just a bunch of definitions that we've used throughout. Uh, but if you'll look at page beginning on page 17. It talks about design standards and the aesthetic plan. And the first part of that is it talks about co-location and, and the ability for these companies to co-locate. And I had to... Uh, <laughs> I had to kind of look at exactly what does co-locate mean. Does it mean with other services? Does it mean just other cell services? Uh, but basically, if there's an existing light pole uh, that has a, has a street light on it, uh, we can require them to locate on that existing light pole. Uh, that, that is considered co-location. Uh, we can, there's, there's certain things that we can do to, to ask them to co-locate on existing infrastructure that's there. They typically don't like to co-locate on electrical poles because of the interference. Uh, they would actually have to go so far above the power lines that's there um, that it would not be feasible for them to, to co-locate on an electrical pole. But there are some existing city-owned uh, structures like utility poles, light poles, um, support structures that uh, may, may run our own radio equipment allow them to use those from time to time. Uh, if you turn on over to page 18, it starts talking about the different districts. Though. The general commercial district, uh, and what we've basically done in this ordinance, we've tried to simplify it down as, as much as possible. So when it says general commercial, that is every commercial district that exists within the city limits. And we're actually going to add a, a portion to that that identifies C2, C3, C4, and C5. So every commercial district that we have will, will go by this specific set of guidelines. Uh, maximum uh, height of 10 feet above the tallest existing uh, support structure. And a maximum of 50 feet above ground. Uh, in the general commercial district, it does give um, the city planner, right now, according to the uh, version that I have, John was working on some different versions. Uh, 
the ability to approve the type of pole that's used, uh, the diameter of the pole that's used, if there's any lights that are going to be required to be on this pole, uh, and also the pole color. Uh, one of the things to note, the application that we have from U.S. Cellular, they're actually using a, a wooden utility pole with all of the conduit on the outside of that pole connected to that pole with an antenna at the top. So that some of the pictures that you see out there are of the steel pole, metal pole. What they're actually proposing is just a wood pole with all of the conduit run up the side and the, the antenna at the top. Um, that may or may not be allowed in the commercial district the way this, this particular ordinance is written. Uh, it would depend on other, other things around it. It would depend on whether or not that commercial district is inside a historic district. Uh, but right now it gives that authority to the city planner. Uh, you guys may want to think about that over time and, and see if that needs to be just restricted to the planning commission or someone else, but uh, that's, that's the approval that we put in there. Okay, now then they're going to be one behind the you said region and bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, it's sweet, it's old Sweetwater Valley Bank. Uh, Thompson County. It's not in the historic district. There's only one that's inside the historic district. Well, that gets my question. Yeah. If you turn around and said, mm -hmm. okay, we don't want no wooden pole there, we've got all black poles down there, you got to put a black pole, and they got to do that. Well, it, uh, as we go on, there is a section for historic property, for historic history. And yes, they would have to put a black powder coated pole uh, in the historic in the history. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next section is general residential. One of the things to note here is, uh, as with most subdivisions across America and in state of Tennessee that we're requiring underground utilities and trying to get away from the power lines being up top and having these tall poles in their neighborhoods and maybe reducing down to just light poles. We kind of kept with that same idea in this general residential district, which is R1, R2, and R3. It's all of our residential districts. But we're requiring a the maximum height is a 25-foot pole. They can use a decorative pole or just a tapered steel pole but it has to be a black powder coated pole. Uh, and, and there is a requirement of a light to be installed on that pole. Uh, there's some suggestion that maybe we shouldn't require the light, uh, something that we can look at and think about. Uh, is that like a street light? Street, it would basically be a street light with an antenna above it. That's basically what it would be at that point. An LED, right? An LED. And we would pay for the the light or would they pay for the light? They would have to pay for that. Would that would that be based on whose house it's close to as well, whether they did or did not want that extra light? Yeah, I, I think there's I think the same factors that go into placing a street light need to go in deciding whether or not a street light's required or not. So let me just ask this question because the way it's written right now it says light requirements full cut off LED placed at a height of 15 feet. So the maximum pole is 25, the light would be at 15. That's correct. Is that where the other street lights are or is it 15 or we don't really know? Okay. So then the next question I have is does that mean that the, is there a way that we can add like a caveat in there that says the city planner or planning commissioner or somebody like that determines whether a light should be there or not. There's, there's or do we want to require a light on every single pole in the residential district? Personally, I don't think we want to require that. I, I don't, don't think, think we, we need, need to. Do that. I think we need to say there are certain times we don't want a light there. Yeah. And, and I also want to, there's, there's certain places here where I mean, normally that decision is made by the street department. Am I right on a street light? I believe is that so. Right? I, no, I think that should be, if, if a decision is going to be made, I don't think we need to vary from that. Okay. Just 15 feet seems kind of low for a street light. It is. And then to twofold, this says max height is 25. They're proposing 37 in this one. That's right. What, I mean, what we plan on doing, Sam, is, is after this is passed, we'll have a planning commission meeting and there will be a representative from USA that we're here. And, and I plan on asking them to adhere to. Right. To these guidelines that we're 
but he don't have it. And, and it may not it may be immaterial, but I don't believe we've got any street lights in Sweetwater that's 15 foot high. How high do you think they are? Everything. Well, I don't think we're probably, I don't know, I'd say they're probably 20, 25 foot, 15 foot. We might have something knocking them down. I think we ought to put in there that either the city planner or the street superintendent may require a light be placed on the pole. Yeah, and that way it gives us total control over whether it's on there or not. Yeah, let's, let's don't get this thing in two different departments now. Uh, if the city planner is going to take care of these things, then that's let the city planner take care of it. I mean, my recommendation is just remove that altogether. And a street light is a street you light. About it, just not having any lights on Sammy? Yeah. I think Sammy's got a good idea there. Okay. And, and that, that suggestion has been made by some citizens who, who kind of looked at this and helped us craft some of this too. So I, I feel a little agree with that. And that's, you're talking about residential only, right? You want us to ask John to remove the section that says yeah, the light for so too. I, I would, I mean, it's, if this was side of my house, I don't want an LED light shining in my place. My right. Place. Now, in the commercial district, it also says that, but do you want to keep it in the commercial district? The, the light requirement there is approved by the city planner. Right. Uh, I think an option there would be That's fine. That's fine. I don't have any problem. I'm like, you know, I say what Sam has said on this thing. Alan makes a statement here, uh, and I've got a, I've got a straight line next to my house, and uh, it's, uh, and I'm going to say, we're probably talking about, the straight line's probably 20 foot high. I'd hate to be looking out my window at a 15 foot LED line. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. there are windows that um, And then same thing for the historic residential, right? We're moving out of historic yeah. residential also. Yeah, so all residential. Yeah. Right? I mean, I don't know how detailed we can get, but I, I could see putting up a green or black powder-coated pole, which is fine and dandy, but everything attaching to that being visual clutter, if it doesn't yeah. match or painted that same, is that a requirement that we can do that all equipment must match the adjacent color of the pole? Be something I'll just have to research. I think yeah. the way it's written now in the historic district, it kind of is that well, way because it yes. says it has to confirm, conform yeah. with. I don't know about every district. Uh, historic district's a little bit different because we have an active historic zoning commission. Uh, they can, uh, they're, they're still asked to approve the design, the colors, all of that. And, and, and these companies not in this section, but only in the back. They would, have, they would be required to get a COA from the Zoning Commission. You're talking about for all districts. No, well, no, just, just, just for particular historic. I mean, out of where I live, you know, another wood pole is not going to make that big a deal. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think I agree with Sammy. I think in certain districts, especially the horse historic district, that it all needs to blend. talks about, it's on page 21 where it talks about direct uh, decorative poles, goes on over to page 22, the historic district, uh, proposed support structure and wireless facility receivers to get the appropriations from the historic zoning commission. That's that, that line item is on page 22. And it also has to meet guideline, other guidelines. The uh, U.S. Secretary of the Interior Standards for Preservation of Historic Properties, um, the aesthetics and character of the district, and, and we, we've typically relied on the Historic Zoning Commission to make sure those things are happening. We're, what we're doing is we're not just doing this for the approval of U.S. settlements. No, sir. No, sir. So and there's going to be others come in. So yeah, I full well expect. Very soon we get one from Verizon and another one from Sprint and so on and so on. Uh, which kind of leads us to 
one of one little caveat that I'm still researching is, is how much distance is required between each pole, or, or can we even limit that? And, um, and I'm not sure that we can limit that. Uh, if so, we have one provider, if they give you a reason why they can't locate on another pole, that's technologically accepted as a, as a good reason. So someone unfortunate to have the spot they want could have 10 poles in their in front of their house because it is a city right away. I, mean, I need to make for sure of that, but there is a section in there that says you can't limit the number. And but it does also say we can require them to co-locate if there's an acceptable pole that's there already, which means even if it's AT&T's, we can require that they work it out with AT&T to locate on theirs. But acceptable. Uh, yeah, they would have to prove though that they, for some reason, needed a 13 higher foot pole or whatever. You know what I mean? Like they would have to show us why it wasn't an acceptable location. So instead of having five poles in front of your house, you're gonna have all the bird perch on top of it. Five antennas to go. Up. <laughs> It's a hard pill to swallow. You may not be to this yet, but can you walk through the process of what they do? Because obviously you all are passing the ordinance, and that includes the process of what these companies are going to have to do, which is not in place yet, but we already have an application for it. So planning commission is going to look at the application that has been submitted. Yes. But do all applications, do the permits come through planning commission every time according to this ordinance, or is it straight? According to this ordinance, they they, they actually new polls, <laughs> which we can change that to city planner. Uh, any any uh, if they're changing out an existing pole, that would come through the city planner. Uh, I think I think they all should come through the city planner. Now I have I have I guess some leeway to put that before the planning commission to get a, a bigger. Because this is seen as a zoning ordinance, I have the ability to put that before the planning commission and ask them to make a decision or a determination on any new polls, any new sites. So any even if they zone review, right? That has to come before. If it doesn't time. conform, discretionary review has to come before planning yeah, commission. If, it, if, if they're proposing something that doesn't fit these guidelines that we're putting in there, they say, "Oh, we can't do a black pole. We can't do." 40 foot pole it has to be 50 feet or, or we can't do a 25 foot pole it has to be 30. Any any variance from that has to come to the board of zoning appeals which is the plan. No. Yeah. Right. We may be going down a rabbit hole but I'm assuming this 25 feet height came from previous ordinances yeah, that come to city. Primarily the but my assumption is that 25 feet it was selected because it, it would work. 25 feet, but they have to be certain height either above or below existing power lines for these, for the data to try, I don't know the right word, but for the data to try. So they either have to be at least 10 feet above an existing power line or so many feet below. And according to Air Kicks with the utility board, most poles are right at 40 feet. And that's about where their lines are. Okay. okay. Follow-up question: What's happening to this <coughs> company USA or anybody company? So look, now we got here. You know, we've got we got to have 35 foot pole right here. We just got to have it. Okay, now then, why is it in Johnson City you were able to all use 25 foot pole? I mean, those those are questions we would have to. They, they would have to justify to us before we yeah, that's what I'm saying. the planning commission. Somebody, the planning commission or yeah. what have we got? Somebody needs to ask those questions. Yeah. If it's accessible, accessible, acceptable in Johnson City, then why can't you do it in Sweetwater? Right. Well, okay. right. And, that, and that, because it would be a variance from what's allowed, okay. no. it would be planning commission's job right. to look at so the process is they submit an application to you. Yes. You provide them probably with a copy of this ordinance showing them and the appendix showing them the rules. Yeah. Typically what they'll do is they'll, they'll email and say, hey, do you have an ordinance on such and such? We email 
mail that out and then they send us an application. We can't ask for a conference at that time with them and, and if I've already identified some sites that won't work, for example, in, in their application, there are some sites here that I'm not sure are going to work because either there's not enough right of way or the city doesn't actually own what, what they think is the city's right of way. Uh, so there's some things already in this application that we're going to have to go back. But during that conference or through a written email or written letter, I would have to make them aware of any deficiencies within 30 days of their application. So if there's anything that they haven't provided me that, we're, that we ask for, for us, for the planning commission or myself to be able to make a good decision that, that yes, it complies with it. And I have 30 days to get them back that information that they have to then reply back to me. At that point, there's a new 30-day clock that starts. Okay? If they give me the information in two days, my 30-day clock starts again. If they get it to me in 29 days, that's when my 30 day clock starts. Uh, it, there, there is a timeline, but it's not rigid. It, it depends on actions of, of both parties. So let's say they give me the information and I make them aware within two weeks that their application is incomplete. I tell them about it, they give me the right information, and then I decide that their application is complete at that point. From that point, we have 60 days from, from the time that they got me the information back to make a decision about whether to approve that application. If, if we do not respond within that 60 days, and, and you have to respond either yes or no, you have to approve it or deny it, if we don't respond approval or denial during that 60 days, it, the state the statute says that's the same thing as an automatic approval. Who is doing the approving or denying though, ultimately? Does every one of these applications come before city board? Is, every, is it just that's, you? Right now it's it just me. Right now it's just the city planner. And, and that's, I guess, as a board, that's, that's what a you decision you need to make. You know, if you want each decision to come to the city full board uh, after the planning commission recommendation, maybe. Um, so for sure it goes to planning commission if anything's non-conforming to what's in the ordinance. But other than that, it's up to Chuck to stay within the timeline. When do they pay the fee? Is that when they submit the application? Yeah, it's up to the Okay. And the, the initial fee is non-refundable. And then once we give them an approval on where all the polls can be placed, it's $100 a year for each poll. That's correct. That they have to pay us every year. And that's kind of up, an in lieu of taxes payment because I do not think five, we'll be pulled on the tax roll. It's, it's 100 up to 5, and then each poll after that is only 15. Well, if they, what did Eric tell us the other night out there that they charge the old company to go call the other old? I don't remember the cluster. It used to be $7 an item a month. I don't know. So if it was $7 an item a month, they'd be better off to hook to it. And it does say we can encourage them to hook to an existing pole if it's in that area. Yeah. Can we force them to co-locate on a utility pole? If they have a, a legitimate technical reason why they can't locate on that pole, we can't require them. But they have to explain why. Yeah, they have to give me a reason why they can forgive the pole. Has, it, has Eric been approached about, about this coming and whether they would even be allowed to attach to their pole? I mean, Yes, uh, Eric has been approached. We've given him information. I've sent him this ordinance to give me some comment back on just to, I just don't have that other information right now. He has a comment back on it. So. Okay. Chuck, I want to ask a question now. It's kind of this shows how little I know. Is this going to do away with the 150s and 60s and 200s, or can they still come? No, those, that's a separate ordinance. They, they would be required to be rezoned as a telecommunications. But is this what people are like for right now? Five yeah. or six companies going to jump on it? What, the reason is um, this: their argument, U.S. Cellular and all these Verizon, their argument is is that the, the large monopoles 
uh, are not carry are not able to carry the amount of data and phone calls that we're getting to as a society. So rather than go to the expense of creating six or seven more of these large towers within municipalities that they're already getting pushback against and paying rent and that kind of thing, they're going to these small cell uh, towers. And what happens is typically if you're in a an area where you have a let's say right here we have a large tower just right down the road. If we had a small cell tower right out front, anybody who's using their phone for data, you're, you're going off of that small cell tower. If you're using your phone to call, it's going to the large cell tower. And, and this is supposed to usher in 5G, which is the next. Like they say they have to have this in place before they can go to 5G in any area, which is just a faster network. So that, that's, that's the reason for it. Okay. Proliferation of a lot of this push. Uh, also, it's an effort to to get get Wi-Fi and the internet and the availability out there to, to more rural areas. As well. Okay. Um, more questions. Are you going to go through the rest, the last few pages? I know there's a thing about if they do any damage to the sidewalks or anything like yeah, that, they're there, responsible to repair it. There's, um, I mean, there's a few, few little more. Uh, compliance with underground facilities, that's another one that if, if, if everything is typically underground in a certain area, we can ask that the, the wires going to their facility be all in the ground. Uh, 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 I'm not far behind you, Mr. Believe it or not. Contractors shall restore, repair, or replace any portion of the public right of way that is damaged or disturbed by their facilities, poles, towers, or work and adjacent to the public right of way. Restoration of pavement, sidewalks, landscaping, grass shall be in accordance with the right of way excavation permit application. Basically, they would have to, anything they tear up, they have to fix when it comes to the sidewalk, to the right of way as a whole, uh, plant grass. If they fail to timely restore it, uh, we, we can do so, uh, and then the provider shall pay the authority's costs and expenses related to such work. Uh, traffic control, they will be responsible for it. If they're doing work in the right of way, they're responsible to, to, uh, to manage their own traffic control. In other words, uh, we're not expecting by a police officer to, to direct traffic around them. They'll have their own flaggers and their own. Uh, however, they will be required to coordinate that with the chief of police. Uh, there, there's a section in there, I think it actually says public works director, but we're going to change that to the, to the city's chief of police. Um, I do think that the new permit should come to you instead of me. I think it yeah, should all be so. you. Uh, if they abandon a, a, a support structure or they're not using it, um, it's written in here that they have 30 days uh, to, to remove it or disconnect and relocate it.
But there's there's inside this ordinance there's a list of about eight eight or nine things that have to be on that application that they the provider has to provide. And it's everything from a uh, longitude latitude description of where that pole is going to be, uh, what it's going to be made out of, surface area. There, there's a lot of information that they have to provide. That's another thing. Uh, for example, this company has, has put application in for eight poles. Uh, I, we cannot turn their application down just because one of those is not right. Uh, I can turn that one pole down, but I can't turn the entire application down. Each, each pole, even though it's only one application, each pole is sort of an individual decision that we have to make. So, and, I, and the 30 day clock, basically, you've got eight day <coughs> clocks that are, that are counting. And, and it can change on each individual pole as we go. So, as it's written right now, we've got the height limits and everything in each district, which you all can change if you think that should be wrong. And we're going to go ahead and ask John to redraft it to remove the light requirement on yes. any residential district. And right now, we're going to change it to where the applications all go through Chuck. Chuck has the approval authority once they submit it. It's not not every application, not any applications, are going to come to the full city board. Is that how y'all want it? I think as long as we have the ordinance set up here, it's going to be set, but there's no reason for it. All of them come to the city The planning commission, each one of the, the planning commission will already be using it. I, I think out of courtesy, it would be a good idea for the planning commission to review the sites. Yes, absolutely. Because but it's not required by the ordinance. No, it's not required it's by the ordinance. It's only required to go to the planning commission if there's a variance from the ordinance. So if that's something you all are really strongly about, you may want to add that. And that's why I was saying use on review is, is what we've got for the big towers, correct? That's correct. How hard is it to... I, I think basically it's just each new application to the, to the city planner and, and for review, for right. staff review, and then to the planning commission for approval. Question this way can it not be better for an application to originate in the planner's office to go before the planning commission or the historic zoning district? And then the recommendations come to the city board for us to vote on it instead of bringing it here. The only thing about that is the timeline. So if they submit you a complete application, which now that we have the ordinance in place, most likely we'll be getting complete applications because they'll read this before they submit it, or hopefully they will. So you're only going to have 30 days to get it through Chuck, Chuck's questions, planning commission, and then city board. I don't know. If everything's in place, right? Well, uh, if, if, every, if, if everything's in place, it's 60 days from that, that initial application. Yeah. I don't know, this is my opinion, I don't know why it would have to come before the city board, but at least through the planning commission. I mean, I, you know, I know I'll go back again, I don't tap on anybody's toes that way, but I mean, we, we sat here and Go before the planning commission on things. Let them. I'm sort of I'm really getting the same on this. I mean, if there's a dispute about something, I can see us getting involved. But if there's not, you know, we go by the ordinance. Yeah. No right. way we can do it. That. I mean, we can we can approve this ordinance by what we what we talked about, and if it meets this ordinance, then there's nothing really else to decide. Okay, so what I'm hearing right now is we're going to have John remove the light requirement from the residential districts, which is in two places as far as I can tell, yeah. and then put a requirement that each application after Chuck reviews it goes to planning commission for approval. Yeah, I think so. I think that's sufficient. I mean, that's a, that's a, a good checks and balance with a system that's already in place. And then if we come up, if I understand it right, we come up, they want to put a tower my backyard. Okay. Now then, if I don't want that tower in my backyard, then I would go to the planning commission where they have a planning commission meets about it. Is 
that right? Yes. And, that would... however, and remember, however, this is only for public right of way. However, if it's in your backyard, there's no, and it meets all the requirements. Well, even though I, you don't like it, there's not really a lot well, of Well, what I'm saying though, as yeah. far as my backyard, if I had a, if we had, a, let's go up on, let's go up on Monroe Street and Rye Street. There's an alley runs all the way from Ingman Park behind all those houses. That's the city But right yes, away. it would be planning commission they would gripe to instead of the city board, but there's probably, city, planning commission will have to approve it. But, they don't I mean, think there the would be nothing can that the city it. board could do either because exactly. the state says you can't do that. So, I mean, it, if it meets these requirements that were established. If we don't establish these requirements, then there's not any requirements. They do what they want. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a lobbyist yeah. telling the state legislature we want this passed, put it on the ordinance. That's all it is. It's it's that's close to communism. That's don't that's don't create no more problems yeah. than we have to. I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I'm a hundred percent for technological advancement. I mean, it's going to happen more than just this right here. What we've got in Sweetwater to me is special. So anything that we can do to keep it from looking like clutter, we have enough of that in certain spots. Well, what they're trying to do is get out paying property owners yeah, rent for the rent building. to put these buildings, yeah. and they say we're going to use the the city's right of ways. Yeah. And this has been passed to the state legislature, handed down, mandated to the municipalities, and that's where we are. It's lobbying these big yeah. Verizon and AT&T companies and all that. It comes down to they, they've got the power to control the state legislature. They would deny that, of course. Okay, do I hear a motion to accept this ordinance as we have discussed it with the changes? Yes, we, with the revision. I make a motion to accept the revision discussed. I'll second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, likewise. Motion does carry. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and this meeting's over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do we have any money in the slush fund? <laughs> I would like to propose that we hire a fourth grade student come down and help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> I know they can You might have a form of emotion. <laughs>